Okay, today is part three, or lesson three, I should say. We're doing um, part one of the 6809 command set or instruction set. And we're also going to talk a little bit about memory addressing modes. That's how the CPU talks to the 64K of memory out there. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, let's see. Uh, Let's kind of dive into it rather than doing a recap and look at and basically an instruction line. And I've got a sample of that where you see the word start, then LDA, then a pound sign in 02. Most instructions are always going to be some simple three or four letter word followed by some sort of extension to the command and uh, that start that's called a label there are no line numbers in the um, assembly language system instead you have labels that reference some point in the program so don't have to worry about doing renums and moving things around and like that like that now basically labels reference labels, they always start at the beginning of the line. That's the thing. There's no, you know, right at the beginning after you do, you know, hit enter, you would type in the label. Now, commands and other information, they always start on the second character. So you can simply hit space or tab to get to the actual instructions of the code. And that's the way this assembler works. If there's the first thing in there, Oh, uh, that means that that's a label. And if it's got at least one space, then it says, oh, these must be the uh, mnemonics of the assembly language, your commands. And spaces can be one, they can be five, they can be 20, whatever you want. They can be multiple tabs. The assembler will understand that and move on. So it's just some type of delimiter between the the label and then the command. And yeah, it's, it's kind of like fields. You've got a, yeah. a label field, and then you've got an instruction field, and then you've got your optional part of the instruction field, and then you've got comments after that. And more importantly, there's only going to be one command per line. Now, in basic, we would go through and do those colons and have multiple commands per line because we're trying to save space. We really don't need to say space because the assembler will assemble it down into the actual machine language of the computer, and a space here, a space there has no effect on what the output is, what that final program is. So why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, let's take a look at, a, at what that line system was doing. As we said before the start was a label, a reference. The LDA is load the A register. Well, much like Linux and like that, assembly language was always short, sweet, simple commands. They wouldn't do load A. No, that makes it too long and hard to type in. So they do help. Excuse me, they do LD for load. Then you've got the A register. So they put the A down. And then the, the pound sign O2, two, well, the first part is O2. That's the number. But what that pound sign is trying to tell you, this is immediate. That means that within the instruction, you're going to have the O2, and that's going to be loaded into the A register. That's a type of addressing mode called immediate. They, they actually store the number in the instruction. And that 02 is technically a hex number? Actually, I just did it. It could have been simply 2 because leading zeros are ignored. But I just did it 02. Yeah. It defaults to decimal in this case. If you put the dollar sign before it, it'll go to hex. And in the case okay. of 2, it's the same either way. But Right. Okay. Yeah. This, this is decimal. Okay. And then you also have binary when you put a percent sign in front of it. 
And we won't talk about Octo because you never use it on the 6809. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. Now, you can load up A using other addressing modes. So you could actually grab up an A from some location in memory or some I.O. port, whatever, transfer the contents. And typically when you're doing this, use the extended, especially the I.O. registers. And so load A FF02 will load it from that PIA that's sitting at that location. Because the way the COCO works is your I.O. ports are memory mapped. They're in the same general locations, loading stuff, just like you do from memory. It's just that the COCO says this part here is not memory. It's I.O. space. And then it can talk to the peripherals and something like that. In the co I'm going to try and do all this stuff in the beginning as uh, strictly um, COCO 1 and 2. We're going to keep it simple. We're not going to start throwing in things like gimme registers and stuff like that. Later, we'll, do, we'll put that stuff in and confuse the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, the, see, the thing about when you do a load A extended, it, the instruction includes the 16-bit address of where you're getting the information. So the first part of the load A, that's one byte. And then you got two more bytes that contain the 16-bit or two words, uh, two byte words of the address. So it takes three bytes to actually do that instruction. Now, the infamous wisdom of Mole Roll when they designed this chip, they knew that you're going to have to have some storage that you could get to very quickly. So they came up with something called direct uh, addressing. And this is where the instruction includes just a single byte to reference the location you're trying to read from. Ah, but remember, addressing is always 16 bits. Well, you get the other 8 bits from the direct page register. Now, originally in the early 6800 series, the direct page was always zero. Same with 6502. Yep. In the 6809, they came up with a register that you could load up. So you could move that pretty much anywhere in memory. So you had 256 direct pages that you could reference. OS9 uses this quite a bit, which yes. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get curious to talk about towards the end with the... Uh, extra stuff that we'll be throwing into the lessons. One thing I wanted to mention too, like given the two examples you have on your slide, if you wanted to use direct page for your first extended address, you could do that by loading DP with FF, which would be the page number that it's in, and then you could do a load A02, and it would grab it from FF02. Mm -hmm. Exactly. and that, that. But see, in the case of OS9, you can have multiple programs running simultaneously, and if you only had one direct page, that would be a problem because they'd all be right into the same page. So when a program starts up, the direct page is pointed to the direct page of that program. Yeah. It's just one of the niceties of having an operating system do that stuff. Now, we're not going to be getting into OS 9 like that. You're going to be doing everything. You're going <laughs> to be doing all the work the OS 9 did, all the stuff that the stuff this basic did or extended basic did and like that so we're gonna we're gonna be just we're not doing rom calls we're not doing operating system calls we're just doing very basic 6809 stuff and we do actually have uh in the second half of our lesson today an actual 6809 program with comments to help you through and that's another thing too is that on every line you can put a comment down you can make a, a line entirely a comment if you want. And the better you start commenting your code, the better you'll understand what your code's doing months later when it's not fresh in your mind. 
also if you're grabbing code from somebody else. It's kind of nice if they did a nice job commenting the code, explaining what they're trying to do. Anyways, um, but just trying to finish off uh, direct page, think of it as shorthand version of the extended uh, addressing. It just makes it faster. It's a byte shorter. It's a clock cycle faster. It's because it's short. It makes things a little faster. So, you, you know, the, the fastest you can access any information is accessing information that's already inside the CPU, like the index registers, the A and B registers, and stuff like that. But the um, direct page is kind of a compromise between a more elaborate dressing, like uh, extended, and talking to the actual registers. So you might kind of look at the direct page as 256 slower internal registers. And that becomes very handy later. Hmm. Why don't we go to the next slide? By the way, the 6502 depends completely on the uh, direct page. And All they right. They have the one. <laughs> yeah, they have the one. That's it. All right. Um, you can also load up the A registers using some of the different uh, index addressing modes. And I've got an example here, load A with 45 comma X. And what that's actually doing is you've got your X register pointing somewhere in memory. And then the 45 says, do it 45 bytes later than where the X is pointing. Now, the interesting thing is it does, while it internally adds 45 to X, X doesn't change. That's the important thing to remember. X is unaffected, but it will point to the uh, thing later. Now, um, this particular instruction, uh, the 45 um, is going to be stored in inside the instruction as one byte. So it'll actually be something on the terms of three bytes for this instruction. So that's the thing you'll have to get used to is depending on the instruction and what addressing modes you might use, the instructions can vary quite a bit. Um, Curtis, I think it's what? Like a load Y with a 16-bit index is about one of the longest yeah, because uh, load structure. Y has the pre pre byte, so it's two bytes just to say it's a load Y, and then you got sixteen, or you got your index register, index portion that tells you which register you're indexing off of. Then you got another two bytes for what memory address it offsets it's at. So it's like five bytes for one one instruction. Exactly. Where if you do an ink or an ink A increment A, it's one byte. So yeah. it goes from one to five bytes. And these are important because every time instruction has a little bit more weight to it by these bytes, well, the CPU has got to go out there and read the instruction. So it's got to read five bytes, and that slows it down. See, um, the reason why you program assembly is you want to go fast. And you got to figure out the fastest way in assembly to do what you're trying to do to keep that speed. And eventually, we'll get more into how big the instructions are, are and how to calculate them in probably the next lesson or two. <laughs> it gets complicated. I just but, wanted to point out, too, with the index register, I mean, it's like index cards, like if you're looking up something. So in this case, 45 come X. That means you have a table of some data at X. Let's mm -hmm. say it's positions on the screen. Let's say you've got a storage of you know sprites or something on a screen. This would be the 45th entry in that table. That's why you don't change X, because then you can reference other ones without having to like add and subtract every single time to the X register. What was that psychedelic lamb? Uh, that's somebody, <laughs> somebody who just followed the, the um, like a subscriber. <laughs> yeah, we loaded 45 comma acid there. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> now, this is only an example of one particular indexing there is a lot of them and actually that's the power of the 6809 over the other earlier processors it gave you lots of ways to index memory and get to it the best way i always like to say 
there, it was never trying to figure out, is there a way to do my job in the 60 to 9? It was just trying to figure out the best way to get that code to work because yeah. it gave you so many options. Let's go to the next page. Yeah, the other the other eight bit CPs at the time because it's so few indexing registers. You might have to do three or four instructions in a row to do the same thing you can do in the six and nine with one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, yeah, we'll wait until you get to the indirect index option. That's going to blow your mind. I'm going to le definitely love watching. <laughs> yeah, we want Steve on camera up. when that happens. Stevie's going to have to be on camera. Yeah, for that. <laughs> it's complicated to explain but it is so powerful anyways um, and, and continuing with the index we have this little comma X it means there's no offset it's a, one of the quickest ways to access something using an index register that says X is pointing somewhere we want that uh, very handy for when you're going to the same location over and over again, makes very fast. Then you've got the uh, one I, these are just a few of them, not all of them, of the indexing modes. Now it looks a little funny with this comma X plus. What that means is go ahead, use the X register to reference that memory location. But when you're done, add one to X. Gee, what do you think something like that's used for? How about clearing the screen? Mm -hmm. You and just you just move to a new position. Yeah. yeah, move to the next position. So you don't have to have an extra command to move X down the row. You can actually do it all in one instruction. So like kind of like, like it's, it's like a, it's like a self learning for next loop. Yep. Kind of. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Okay. And then of course we got that other example from earlier, forty five comma X. And the main thing to remember about this, it kind of adds 45 to the X address, but it's not actually adding it to X. Internally inside the CPU, it has mathematical units, and it loads up X, adds 45, and that now points to where it wants to go, where it wants to get the information. You can also do interesting things, such as having one of your accumulators, A, B, or D, use as an offset to the X register. By the way, when I'm using X register, it's X, Y, uh, U, or S, the, the four index registers. And uh, so once again, it adds it internally to the value that's in the X register and the A register together, and that now points to where you're looking at memory. And this comes in handy for doing things like old sprite manipulation and and other references going in index index tables, and we'll do a bunch more of these later. Now, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? Now we're going to actually show you a program. Now, these program this program I'm going to show you is not designed to be efficient. It's designed to let you understand what's going on. After all, it's always better for a teacher to educate their students at the level that they're best learning at, opposed to trying to demonstrate how tricky and how smart you are in assembly. You'll just confuse them. Anyways, you can see the word start as the first line there, and that is the point that you enter this bit of code. And do, you, do you have to have a command after start, or in this case here, start is its own, it's its own blank line, basically? You, you, do not, you Yeah. It just says, the first thing in, in a line, that is my label. And I like labels that explain what you're doing and like that. All right. The first real command, if you notice, it's been pushed over a little bit by a few spaces. Mm -hmm. Load X with 1320. That's a decimal number. And that is going to be used for the length of of the tone. This program is going to actually create a sound, a tone. And this allows me to set how long the tone will be. I'll run roughly about three seconds. Now we have, we're going to be doing loops. They're like four next things inside BASIC, but 
you don't really have a foreign X. You, you have things with labels and counters and branch instructions, and we're going to go through all those. So time loop is the main outer loop of trying to create a tone, which is nothing more than running for a short while low and then making the sound output port go high and running at a certain length of time, then back to low, and then after a time, bringing it back high. And what you're doing is you're just ta causing the speaker in the TV monitor or whatever to go in and out at that speed. And so the first thing I do, load a with the pound sign. That means immediate O2. So the O2 or the number two is inside that instruction and loads it up into the A register. The store at dollar sign FF22, well, the dollar sign is hexadecimal. That's the hexadecimal address of the 6-bit DAC port. Now, also on the DAC port, in one of the bits, that's not, you know, that's not part of the DAC, since their you know, port is 8 bits, is the status of the output serial line on the bit banger port. And it has to be high. If you make it low, it puts out weird information to your printer. So when it's not printing anything, it's always high. So we have to make sure that is high. Is that the FFs? Those are the all-ons, or is that... Well, no, the, the, zero two, the zero 02 is making bit... You have bit 0, and you got bit 1. Bit 1 is the 2. Okay. Remember our math? Uh, yep. Each bit goes... Uh, yeah. either 0 or 1, 0 or 2, 0 or 4. Well, yeah. that's what we're getting at. Yeah. So the, this is so one the, case where I usually use the percent sign because for me, it, in my brain, it makes it a bit clearer if I actually put the individual bits so I know exactly which bit I'm turning on or off. But that's yeah. just me. So that's yeah. the, so then and you're putting I, in the binary number. You're going to be actually putting in a 1-0 then for the number 2 in binary? Yes, exactly. So you put... Uh, but, okay. But I didn't use it in this, in this example because I didn't want to confuse people. Right. Now, computationally, is it faster for the 6809 to process that binarily rather than decimally? Actually, what's going on here is the assembler is converting it into binary. Yeah. Okay, as far so as the 6809 is concerned, the end result is the code the assembler is going to generate is exactly the same. There's okay. no change. You can so this, specify so this, octal, this, binary, decimal, hex. The assembler takes care of that. Okay, so this, this becomes kind of the personal preference of the programmer at this point, how they wish to notate things, either decimal, exactly. binary, or even hash. Exactly. Could you have loaded? Now, the, the hashtag, the pound sign means loaded immediately, but the zero two, 2 if you wanted to put that in as a hex number, would you put like dollar two? Yep. Yep. Okay, but by putting zero two, by, by not putting a punctuation in front of the number, it's assumed to be decimal. Correct. Right. Okay, dollar is hex, and then what was the other one for binary? Percent. Percent for binary. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. Yep. Well, you know, if we can keep Steve's mind from blowing up, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> it's a win. Yeah. Anyways, um, so what we do is we've loaded up this number that we want to put in the I.O. port. We put in FF22, and what that does is it makes all the bits of the digital to analog converter low or zero. So it puts the output of the DAC at the lowest level. Now, what, as I say, what is confusing, the top six bits is the DAC. And the next bit down, that's the serial port on the back of Coco. And I forget what the the lowest bit is, but that's an input bit. Doesn't matter. Now, load B with 144. This is going to be used for counting how long we wait in a loop while we have the thing low. So, you know, it, I just loaded up the B register. I could have loaded up the A register, but I just chose the B register 
for this one. Why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. This slide is mostly the time delay loop for how long we're keeping it low before we go up high. And then what it does, it'll actually go up high. So let's go through it quickly. DEC means decrement or subtract one. The B means do it from the B register. Now this is a very quick, simple instruction. It's um, one byte long, two clock cycles, happens very quick. Then we have the next instruction. And I haven't talked about these at all before. The B and E stands for branch if not equal. What the hell is that? Well, sounds like if then else. It's kind, kind of like of. that. Kind of like yeah. that. But what do you mean equal? I don't. I didn't do anything with an equal sign. Ah, equal. Another way to look at it is branch if not zero. And for some reason, they didn't want to do that. They want to do equal instead of putting a Z down. And it's the way Mulroll decided to call the instructions. But basically what it says is the previous instruction, it's going through and it's taking the value um, from 144 to 143, 140, you know, et cetera. But eventually when it gets down to zero, that's your, that's, that's your, that's your delay counter loop right there. Those right. three lines. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Those I follow lines. that. Yeah. You could also but, think of the E for empty branch, if not empty, right? If it's not zero. Well, let's keep to zero. The reason okay. why is when you do a mathematical operation, which is what subtracting one from B is, you set some flags uh, that are part of the CPU. You have a flag uh, if the number is negative. You have a flag if it's zero. You have something called an overflow flag and like that. So... A flag gets set when you do a mathematical operation. And in this case, we're looking to see if we finally get down to zero. You're going to find that when it comes to working with the CPU, it's better to do countdown loops because it's just easier to think about. Because you put, I got to do this 10 times. So you put number 10 in the counter, you keep decrementing until you reach zero. You've now done it 10 times. So the branch, if not equal, means it's going to go back to that tone loop low. This is where we're keeping the thing low. Well, all right, we've gone through our time to have that thing low. The next step is to make the DAC go to 63, which is the maximum what the DAC could be. That's the highest voltage. So what we'll do is... We'll load A with FE. That's all the bits being set, except for the bottom one, which, which really be, didn't matter. FF, right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it makes the DAC 63, and then we store it into the DAC port. And that so, makes so you you lo you loaded the number L load A says basically plug this number into register A. Store A then says take it from A and then stick it into address FF20, which is a DAC port. Right. That's one thing we do not have on the processor is to take an immediate number. And stick it straight to memory? And st stick it straight in the stuff. You have to go into the processor, then out again. There, okay. are, there are some CPUs that have that ability, but they're far and few between. And then once again, we load up 144 and B for our counting loop. So let's go ahead and see what the next page is. It's almost identical. The first thing we have is a t delay loop called tone loop high, where we've got the thing high. So we decrement B, do the same thing. Branch, if not equal, in other words, if we haven't got the zero flag set because we got down to zero in the B register, go back and loop again, uh, basically go back to the uh, decrement B. Now we have a brand new instruction after that. And it's probably the hardest one for some folks to learn about the 6809. 
load the effective address that's coming next into the X register. Well, if you notice, there's a negative one, com X. So remember before I talk what about... What am I not seeing here? I think you got to go up a page, Steve. Did I go, did oh. I go too high? Hold on. No, for the other direction, yeah. Uh, one more? One more? There you are. There you go. Okay, I went the wrong direction. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm like, what's this you guy talking about? You when you should have inked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, as I said, this is similar to the previous page where we decrement B, do a branch if not equal, back to this the top of this delay loop. But the next instruction of load effective address X means whatever you create for the address next to it, put that in X. And effectively it means you can use any of the addressing modes that sit for the index registers, do a calculation and put it in the X register. And I'm using this one to do a count backwards down in a fairly large number because when we're doing this tight up and down on the tone, the number was less than 256. So we could use a single 8-bit counter. But this other guy here is much larger. It's a 16-bit number. So what we have to do, we have to use a 16-bit counting system. And the index registers happen to be 16-bit. So we're decrementing the X register. I know it looks so fine, and we're going to cover much more in detail later about the instruction. But just remember, this is doing a 16-bit size counter. Yeah. Two bytes. The way, the way I view load effective address that made it easier for me to understand when I began was that I view that basically as the equivalent of X equals X minus 1. Because mm -hmm. that's what it's doing. It's taking whatever's in X, subtracting one from it, and then putting it back into X. If you change that to, say, an LDA Y minus 1 comma X, then it would be Y equals X minus 1. And then exactly. there's all the other indexing modes you can add registers together in large numbers, small numbers. It's it's quite a great instruction to have. Yeah, it, w it was introduced first on 6809, and it really per the power. Now, we've got that branch, if not equal, or in other words, branch, if not zero, to go back up to the time loop. And if we go back t two pages... There's our time well, loop. There's right. the time loop. So mm -hmm. it's going to run through all that stuff again. And it's going to do it 13, 20 times. And what that's going to roughly do is create a tone of about 440 hertz for three seconds. Hmm. Because this timing loop will run roughly for three seconds. And... Each of those highs and lows are half of what 440 would be. Because when you're looking at, at a tone where you've got a number going, you know, up and down, you got to wait half of the speed of the tone. And then you, get, you add the two together, and you've got the full speed of the tone of the 440. So this is starting to give you an idea uh, also how we go through and try to, well, let's, let's see, let's get you back on a, on that final page where it's got at the top the, uh, okay, you're there on the high tone loop. Anyways, after we complete doing this, I load A with zero two and then store A into the DAC port. That's bringing it low and leaving it off. Turning off the DAC when you're done? Yep, exactly. we got to clean okay. up after ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the RTS, that basically kind of ends the code and returns. That, that stands for return. Um, and, and we'll get into how RTS works. That's um, after we finish all the index stuff because that's a powerful instruction. It allows us to create subroutines that can get used over and over again, just like in basic where you got to go mm -hmm. sub and goes right. off and does something. Well, this ends the routine. Okay. Kind of like return in basic. Yeah, return to sender. Okay. 
Now, if you want to load up, you know, get, you know, all the 6809 instructions, just do a Google search for 6809 instruction set. And there's uh, several good websites and PDFs that are out there. Yeah, Darren good. Atkinson's is my favorite one. He's, he's got the 6 through 9 stuff in there, too, that if you want, but it actually highlights them so you know which ones are for which chip. And uh, he's also the guy that designed the original Coco SDC, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Right. Now, we're also just going to stay with one thing. We're only doing 6809 here. We're not doing 6309. Yes. I don't want to confuse you that much. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that uh, if you download Darren's, which is a very well laid out manual and explains everything really nicely, even sample codes, bits and stuff, that you are aware there is six or nine stuff in there. So make sure you read carefully. Yeah. But um, any, anyways, um, how, how did that go for you, Steve? Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. Yeah, I was hoping to avoid scrolling. blowing your mind. Uh, I was hoping David would be on later to do that. <laughs> Yeah. Now, when yeah. we get to extend it or indirect index, that'll that'll blow his mind. So I'm, I'm yeah, comfortable yeah, with definitely. that. Yeah. And uh, you know, also when we got to get in there and show them why you would use that, and that's the extra level on top of it. Lists lovely things. It'd be like teaching him three dimensional arrays. That's what's gonna be. Like. All right. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I think that's good for today. We don't want to go too yeah. long with this. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Any, any, any questions from so any of the viewers that are on the call, or, or including Stevie? Yeah, I was just trying to scroll through the slides again um, as I was looking through it to see if anything came to mind, because I didn't want to interrupt too much during the presentation. Um There's so a question from, from yeah. um, Mark Siegel about uh, why why didn't you use the single bit sound port instead of the DAC? For your Where sound is that in, in the live chat? Yeah, live chat scroll back a bit. Okay. Yeah, I could always do that, but you know, my my guess is that because eventually you'll be using six bit sound to use you know to do better sound generation you could do with one bit so why not just start with the good right. one to start start with the code yeah start with the code <laughs> in place in the first place yeah and then yeah and place. of course the reason why i picked this particular style you know i could have had you changing a byte on the screen for this sample i just wanted to give you an idea of what code looks like now i yeah. could go through and rewrite this code so it'd be only maybe about six lines of code uh -huh. Or something like that. But it was confused the hell out of you. Sure, sure. So this is like the um, the more uh, verbose way of breaking it down where you can explain it step by step. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, this will create roughly a 440 hertz, hertz tone for about um, three seconds. Neat. Mm-hmm. Neat, neat, neat. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to, um, hopefully I'm only a few slices of knowledge away from figuring out how to use this little um, IDE that I've got. And so then not only can I work on basic stuff, but I've already got the same tool. I can start plugging in some assembly stuff all in the same tool and putting it on the same disk image and, and things like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get, um, you know, trying to get my work environment set up to where I'll be ready for this, hopefully very soon. Mm -hmm. 
Cool stuff. Anybody else in the live chat? And a lot of conversation going on in the live chat. A lot of sidebar stuff going on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, seems like most of the people in the chat are already seem to be somewhat familiar with assembly and, uh, and the processors and things like that. So, a lot of that conversation going on. Anybody else in the live chat here that's with us uh, have any questions or comments or anything else? Yeah, and more for, more so from the beginners, too, because, I mean, that's who we're trying to steer yeah. this towards. Yeah. yeah, you know, that's the thing is somebody that's already familiar with assembly is going to get awful bored with these lessons <laughs> until we get into the, some of the more complicated stuff. But the, the main thing is that you should have some experience programming in assembly in basic and that's what i'm basing this on so you've been experienced with some of the concepts that are involved in programming but we're trying to teach you a new language but you can see that you we're doing a very simple thing mm -hmm. and you can kind of get an idea of how we're setting up the program and about half of what i'm going to have in these lessons is trying to take a real-world example and how you use the language to do it, what instructions do it, and why they do it, and why you're particularly picking this one over that one. So a good example was I was using the B register to do the timing loop for the up and down of the system, where in the case of um, how long this thing should run for, I was using the X register because I wanted a 16-bit counter. Okay. And other than using the index registers, there's no good 16-bit counter type thing inside the 6809. 6309, that's a different story. But, um, you know, you, and okay. by the way, we could have stored a number in the direct page and decremented that that location in direct page to do the same thing too. So if you needed the A and B registers to do part of the operation of this loop, you could use a memory location as a counter. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could use D as a 16-bit kind of counter as well, but then you wouldn't have A or B because that's combined makes D. You wouldn't have A or B free to actually write stuff to the DAC. So that's mm -hmm. why Steve right. chose X instead. Yep. And one of the and, uh, critical things when you go to the 6803 is you're, you have fewer registers, so incrementing or decrementing memory is kind of important. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's lots of trade-offs like that. But as I said, we're going to keep this 6809, not the any of the uh, other processors. Because if we start throwing other processors yep. into the mix, you are going to get totally confused on what you're supposed to do. Okay. Yeah, and I know the purpose of this right now is to keep it simple and to slowly build a foundation. Uh, Mark Siegel just says, you should have talked about the user stack as one of the addressing modes. And I don't know if you mentioned that in an earlier presentation. I, I know you talked about all the different registers. Yep. And well, for this a sample, we didn't use it. Mm -hmm. uh, later, the U register is going to get used. The S register is going to get used, and we'll go through that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are some considerations why you would want to use one register or another. Now, one thing, you know, trying to blow Stevie's mind here real fast. When you do arithmetic work on things like the A and B and the D register, they affect the condition codes of whether or not something's zero, whether or not there's a carry or whatever. Well, the load effective address command, you saw me there where I used it to affect the zero flag by decrementing it by one. And that works on the Y and X register. Does not work on the S, or, you know, the stack register, the S register, or the user stack register. And when we get to those, we'll go into Y. But they do not affect these um, zero flag. Okay. And there's reasons for it. And I see Curtis going, <laughs> I know those reasons too. Hmm. Well, Mikey, our good friend Mikey, who has given us our uh, DriveWire Python tool, he says, uh, I was watching the assembly tutorial while driving and survived. <laughs> <laughs> you was watching? 
<laughs> Next he'll do it while hang gliding. Hopefully one eye was on the road, Mikey. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, my, speaking of Mikey, when Ron Klein was giving me some of the behind the scenes on the Cocoa Pie, the Python DriveWire server is one of the options that's on there. And the nice thing about that is it'll let you use Disk Extended Color Basic with, uh, you know, uh, like stuff that ordinarily would require OS 9 to do, like your IP Telnet BBSing stuff in, in um, on a, an RS DOS, shall we say. So that's one of the nice things about that um, Python drive wire. So thanks for thanks for dr- make sure you always drive safe, uh, Mikey. <laughs> um, good stuff, good stuff. This concludes another episode of Coco Talk the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the Tandy flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8 Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, click the Patreon link at our website at cocotalk.live. Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world, keeping the tiny flame alive. We may be mocked, but we'll never stop, because Coco Talk is rocking the 8-bit world. Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, crew, and contributors. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Mark Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Nick Marentes, Ron Delvo, Rick Adams, Jason Riker, Richard Lorbieski, Jim Brain, Tom C., Rob Inman, Mark Bosley, Brian Joyce, Ken Riker, David O'Connor, Brian Weasler, Terry Steggy, Nick Marota, John Strong, and many more, especially to Steve Bjork for production suggestions and James Diffendaffer for making my head explode. Please help support the Coco community by visiting some of its various contributors. A list of resources is available at imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A-C-O-C-O-N-U-T dot com. The Coco Talk theme song is copyright 2008 by D. Bruce Moore and Greg Sheeler. Mixed, mastered, and produced by D. Bruce Moore. <laughs>